Okay, we're uh, in 1 Corinthians um, 11. We're going to finish that up today and, and try to move into 12. Um, but again, Paul dealing with the Holy Spirit through Paul dealing with all kinds of issues that these people were having. And we noticed last week, uh, as we got into verse 17, um, they obviously were having some issues of all things with the Lord's Supper. And it would appear that perhaps they were either treating it like a common meal or at least mixing uh, a common meal with it. And in doing so, um, they weren't being very Christ-like even about sharing what they had with others who had less. And certainly, um, you know, we don't partake of a common meal during worship. Um, the Lord's Supper has a very uh, specific purpose, and that is to remember what Christ did for us and His sacrifice. Uh, and as we got over to um, uh, verse 26, after He describes the way Christ instituted the supper. And by the way, the Lord's Supper was instituted of following the Passover meal, but he didn't combine the two. Um, but after he rehashes, if you will, what Christ did that night, what the emblems represent, um, the, bread, the unleavened bread representing his body, uh, the fruit of the vine or the cup, as the term is used here, representing his uh, blood, the new covenant that he ushered in with his blood. Um, he says, as often as you eat it and drink it, you proclaim, you show forth in a public way the Lord's death, number one, and we do that till he comes. And so um, there is also an element there of looking forward uh, to his return. In other words, uh, this, uh, his death is also tied into his second coming. Uh, and certainly all of these things are tied together, his death, his resurrection. Uh, and so it's extremely important, and we kind of got down into this last section of how we take it. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, some translations say uh, unworthily, um, but in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Well, um, hmm. let a man examine himself. Examine who? Himself. Not others. We don't practice closed communion. Somebody comes in, sits down, takes it. We don't snag the tray and say, well, you're not, right? You're supposed to be doing what? Not examining others, but examining yourself, myself. Uh, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment, to himself, or condemnation, I think some translations say. Not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. So, bottom line, we don't take of it in a correct way. Then he says, we're what? What's the bottom line? Right. He says, uh, you're guilty of the body and the blood, and we eat and drink judgment or condemnation. Again, it's just another passage that uh, makes you scratch your head when you think about false doctrines like the impossibility of uh, apostasy or perseverance of the saints. Because we're not discerning, he says, 
the Lord's body. Thayer says to separate or make a distinction. Um, we're not considering the Lord. And it's interesting, he says, we're not considering the Lord's what? Body. Now, which body is he talking about? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe both. I mean, if I'm, if I'm taking the Lord's Supper properly and I'm reflecting upon His death and what He did for me, well, that would certainly seem to involve His physical body, His physical pain and suffering, and yet we know the body of Christ, the spiritual body of Christ, is what? Is the church. Well, the results are really no different if I'm examining myself properly. Um, but I'm not discerning the Lord's body. I'm not discerning either His or the church that He brought into existence through His death and the suffering that He did in His body. So... Yeah, and I got to thinking about what you raised last week about contextually again about these are definitely adverbs here. It's not about, uh, he says, whoever partakes of it unworthily or in an unworthy manner. So it's how we take it. It's not really an emphasis here on my character. Because again, like we said, I mean, everybody could find a reason, I suppose, why they would feel unworthy. <laughs> you know, to partake it. But that's not what it's about. What it's about is, how are you taking it? Well, um, and you mentioned the context of the way they were treating one another, but it even goes beyond that because remember, also in the context, it would appear that they're either combining it with a common meal or they've made it into one. So again, how can you take of it properly? You know, if you're, if you're more concerned about food consumption, which is kind of like us sometimes today, right? We're in the middle of the Lord's Supper, and what are we thinking about? Where am I going for lunch, right? You know, man, I'm getting hungry. Uh, but uh, so again, yeah, I mean, I think contextually, you, you, you know, you may very well be right. It's what was happening here was an issue with the assembly, the worship assembly. So very well could be talking about his spiritual body, not discerning the Lord's spiritual body, the church. That's a good point. For this reason, many are weak. They're infirm, they're feeble, they're sick, they're invalid. Now, if you're a Calvinist, you would have to take the position this is physical. But that doesn't meet the context either. Um, Paul's talking about what kind of feast. The Lord's Supper is what kind of supper or feast? Is it physical or spiritual? And I realize there's physical emblems, but it's all about what? It's all about spiritual things, right? So in the context, this is a spiritual feast. And so uh, what they're taking represents things that are spiritual. Um, so I don't see taking something that represents something that's spiritual and giving it a physical, well, they were giving it a physical application, you know, making it into a time of really gluttony and irreverence. And because of that, they were spiritually weak. That's what he's talking about here. You're weak, you're sick spiritually. And when he says you sleep, what? Sleep was many times used in the New Testament as a euphemism for what? Death. You're, you're spiritually dead. The way you're behaving, your attitude, the way you're conducting yourself with regard to the worship assembly and the Lord's Supper. Weak, sick, and many sleep. Um, so... Um, You have to examine yourself properly. Now he says, I guess the question we have to ask ourselves after all of this, before we go any further, is uh, 
How important is worship? How important is the worship assembly? Right? I mean, we tend to treat it sometimes as an optional thing. It's not a big deal. There's people all over the world that, you know, well, I can be spiritual, you know, by myself. You know, I can go out into the nature, you know, reflect on spiritual things. Yeah, you can do that. But that's not a substitute. And nothing but spiritual illness results from assembly abuses. It's there, as we talked about earlier, go back to the beginning of this context. Go back to the very first verse. In giving these instructions, I don't praise you since you come together what? Not for the better, but for the worse. We should come away from the assembly strengthened, encouraged, edified. And that's only going to be done if two things happen. We do it the right way, as God's instructed and we do it with the right attitude. That goes back to John 4, 24, right? Worship in spirit and in truth. So, he says here, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Well, uh, don't let that fool you there. It's interesting. These two words, these English words for judge are two different Greek words. The first one means to discern or to make a decision after examination, properly discriminate. So if we would judge ourselves, if we would properly discern, discriminate, examine ourselves, if we would do that, then we would not be what? Yeah, judged in the sense of a legal judgment, found guilty, if you will. And so... Here in this context, they're not properly discerning between a common meal and a spiritual one. They're mixing them. And therefore, uh, they stand in condemnation. Legal judgment. Yeah. Consider how you fit in the body and what you're doing with your brothers and sisters. And it's, it's a, you know, it's, if you don't put the mental exercise, and sometimes it, it can almost be exhausting. If you pour your heart into it, people, people come forward after a sermon and, and they pour in their heart out. Why? Because they've been in worship. And it's an internal thing. And before they leave, they please pray for me. And it, it kind of takes place at the Lord's Supper. It's a real quiet, introspective. Um, and if you do it right, it's very emotional. It's very emotional. So. Um, yeah, and the thing about corporate worship in the New Testament is... It has both elements of um, fellowship where some of the things and the things we do encourage one another. I mean, when we sing together uh, or, when, or when preaching, the uh, preacher is, is, they asked Paul on one occasion in Acts, would you like to have, say, a word of exhortation to the people? Uh, the preacher is exhorting us. Uh, the singing, uh, we're speaking to each other, one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It's reciprocal. We're not being entertained. That's why we don't have a choir and we all sit here and listen. Um, but it's reciprocal in action. And yet this is one area, uh, and, but yet we all have to be involved 
mentally, personally, but this is one area where, uh, again, no one can do any of these things for us, but especially when it comes to the Lord's Supper, if we're going to take it correctly. I mean, I'm the only one that can do that. I may not be the best singer in the world, but I can sing, but nobody may know that, you know, when we're all singing together. But, um, but it's, it's very personal. Um, so I think that's a good point. It's very important. And notice when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord. That kind of reminds me to chasten is to correct, to discipline, to instruct, to train. You know, there's a lot of different kinds of chastening, right? You don't go straight to corporal punishment, uh, generally speaking, unless what somebody or some child did was very bad. But by and large, uh, there's a lot of different avenues of chastening. Um, and this word for chasing here is the word that's used for the training a father gives to his child. Well, that reminds us, of course, of Hebrews chapter 12, right? Where it compares God's chastening to that of the father with his children. Well, in this case, these people, and us as well today if we're having problems with it, but these people are already being chastened, right? as they read this letter. I mean, that's what God's Word does. It instructs, it trains, it, it corrects, right? That the man of God may be complete. And so uh, they're, they're being chastened already with this letter that Paul has written by these very words so that we're not condemned with the world. All right, then he gets down here in this last little section of the chapter and closes it out. Therefore, my brethren, you know, based on what all I've just said, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Well, in this context, it looks to me with verse 34, but if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, uh, lest you come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come. Look, if you're going to have one of these... You're going to have a common meal together. Look, if you can't wait on other people and you can't share what you got, what should you do? Stay home and eat. Uh, don't treat people this way. Well, especially not your brothers and sisters in Christ. But again, that meal is not part of the worship assembly. I was reading, um, I think I was reading, I mentioned uh, Philemon, um, the church that met in his house and so forth, as an example the other day uh, about this, you know, issue that somehow with eating, quote, in the church building and the fact that, you know, what would that mean for the family that had the church meeting in his house? But I believe, let's see, where was I reading yesterday? Um, somewhere in Romans chapter 16. Uh, oh yeah, Romans chapter 16, here's another example. Verse 3, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is what? In their house. So again, another example of Christians meeting someone's house. So it would be very difficult to tell this couple Aquila and Priscilla, oh, you're not allowed to eat in the church building. Uh, I don't know where they would go. So that's not what he's talking about. Look at this last phrase. We mentioned last week, by the way, the fact that he says wait for one another. Remember back then, um, you know, I have a watch on. That's kind of old-fashioned, I guess. Uh, most people look at what? Their phones nowadays, I guess. Uh, but I bought this watch when I was in high school. So it's kind of hard for me to give it up since it still works. Uh, but even, uh, and it's been through a lot. Uh, but um, they didn't have watches even of the simplest sort back then. Um, so... Uh, 
Uh, it wouldn't be surprising to know that they probably arrived at different times. But wait on one another. And notice this last phrase, and the rest will I set uh, in order when I come. Hmm. So what do you think? What does that mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so obviously, uh, it would appear from that, just that one little statement that, hey, that's not the only problem these people have. But Paul says, well, you know, I guess some things I'm just not going to get to in this correspondence. You know, you got a lot of problems. Well, correct what I can, and then I'll just have to get there and take care of the rest kind of thing. So um, we got a lot in 16 chapters, a lot of problems. A lot of issues. Uh, getting ready to switch to a whole different one for three chapters. Um, but more than likely, he didn't cover them all. Any questions or comments? Yeah. Just real quickly about the eating and drinking unworthily. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think most people, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, people's minds drift, but, you know, I, my mind drifts. <laughs> you know, we don't all have 100% uh, focus. Uh, I doubt there's anybody in here that has 100% focus from the time that the first song or prayer is said till the last one is said, even in an hour. But, you know, we need to be uh, mature enough and uh, self-controlled enough that that doesn't last too long, you know. We ought to be able to bring ourselves back, uh, you know, um, uh, into where we ought to be fairly quickly, I would hope, as mature Christians and adults. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I wouldn't... Well, first of all, I don't... Yeah. It's a very private, personal thing. I mean, I, nobody here is going to know how much I drift and how long I'm gone. So, you know, it's going to be hard to any one person to judge me on. Well, you know, you were gone too long. You were out of it a little too long. It, it just gets embarrassing when your head does that. That embarrasses my wife when, when I do that. But, you know, I try to avoid that when I can. All right. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. Uh, spiritual gifts. Um, obviously, these people had some issues. Uh, with Notice how he starts, he changes subjects here. Now, concerning spiritual gifts. By the way, you'll notice in probably in your Bibles, gifts is italicized, meaning it's not in the original. But that word is used throughout these chapters, and so it's obviously that's what it's referring to. Um, you can divide these chapters uh, maybe this way. Chapter 12 is the existence of these gifts. Chapter 13, the expiration of the gifts. Chapter 14, the exercise uh, of the gifts. Um, he's going to go into some explanation about, you know, who has them and why and... Uh, uh, what they're for, the unity that should be associated with them, the humility that should be associated with them. I mean, obviously, the, again, this is a problem with division. And we're going to see that uh, he's going to have to talk about, hey, they come from one source. They've been distributed to different people, different gifts, but they come from the same source. And he's going to use the human body to emphasize the unity that we should have, even though there's different ones. And by the way, what was their biggest problem? Apparently, when you read these three chapters, mainly it gets down to what? What was their, they weren't, you know, humility was a big problem. And so what were they saying? What, what, what's the issue with these people? 
My gift's better than your gift, right? Mine's more important than yours. And in some people, you know, what about the ones that didn't have one? Man, you're really a nothing, right? Not everybody had them. And certainly they didn't have the same ones. As far as we can tell, the only ones, the only people that would have been able to do all of these things would have been the apostles. And they're the ones that were allowed to distribute them. And so we're going to see what the purpose of them is, what kind of attitude they should have had exercising them, um, and so forth. And he's going to list them, nine spiritual gifts. And then at the end of this chapter, he's going to, in a similar way, talk about different offices in the church. And the, again, the unity and the humility that must accompany these things. And somebody says, well, um, we don't have those today. Well, what's, you know, what's this mean to me? Well, we can learn a lot, attitudinally, as far as the roles that we all play. Not everybody can has. Look, you can take spiritual gifts and you can analogize to natural gifts and not everybody has the same ones and not everybody can do the same thing and not everybody does the same thing in the church. But that doesn't make any one person of more value or more important than any other member of the body. So, he turns from the Lord's table now to these spiritual gifts and we've got some examples of how they received them. Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 18 may be the best, but you can also go to Acts 19 and 2 Timothy 1. But we know from all of those, see, Philip goes down, he preaches to the Samaritans, and they obey the gospel. And they're baptized for the remission of sins. But what has to happen for that church to receive any kind of gifts? For their, to keep them on the right track. What? Yeah, the apostles. They send for Peter and John who come down and distribute these gifts. We see in Acts chapter 19, same thing. Paul comes through the coast of Ephesus. He runs into some fellows that were obviously baptized uh, upon the preaching of Apollos back when he was bat, uh, preaching the baptism of John. Paul has them baptized correctly. And, upon, and at, at that point, then, he distributes some gifts. We also see in 2 Timothy 1 that Timothy got his gift from who? Paul. So, uh, it's interesting. Paul actually laid some groundwork for these things earlier. If you go back to what? Uh, chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Yeah, I've transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. That no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Who, who, who makes thee to differ from one another? What do you have that you didn't receive? And if you received it, why do you glory as if you hadn't received it? Now that goes all the way back to chapter 4. What's the point? Which one of you earned his gift? And which one of you went out and got it himself? Right? There's a reason it's called a gift, a spiritual gift, because it was given to them. And so you got no reason to boast the fact that you have it. It's the same way in, in, in athletics. I mean, there's, and I realize to, to become a world-class athlete in any sport, it requires a lot of work. But you have to begin with a certain amount of what? Natural ability. I can tell you right now, I could practice my whole life as much as LeBron James and never start in the NBA. Because I don't have the talent. I'm too short, I'm too slow, whatever. Can't jump, whatever the case might be. So. Even people at that level have to understand that at some point, this, I, I didn't earn, they may have worked hard, they, obviously they worked hard to get to some point where they're at. But a certain amount of that was frankly just a gift from God, their natural ability. Uh, and certainly it was that way with these spiritual gifts. They were filled with pride, 
better than others because of the gift they got. Some didn't have one. And notice what he says here. I don't want you to be ignorant. Well, that's kind of an interesting statement. You could just take that out of context by itself and look at that all day. Here's an apostle inspired of the Holy Spirit who says to Christians, I don't want you to be what? Ignorant. Now, in this context, he doesn't want them to be ignorant about these gifts, but God doesn't want us to be ignorant about anything when it comes to his word what it takes to please Him, and what it, how, it, how we will live. And there's no reason for us to be ignorant. Right? If I'm ignorant of what God has told me or expects of me, then whose fault is that? Well, it has to be mine. Right? I've got as much access to this as any of you. And in fact, uh, you know, I used to hear growing up old Preachers used to say, uh, you know, uh, wouldn't want to be a Christian from the Bible Belt on Judgment Day who didn't live properly. Well, what, what was their point? They were talking about the advantages that most of us have had when it comes to having access to and knowledge of the Word of God. And many people just take that for granted. When people in other parts of the world may not have the same access, same advantage. You know, they weren't born into, I mean, we like to use, we use this phrase sometimes, I was raised in the church. Well, obviously you weren't a Christian when you were five years old. But what we mean by that is you were raised by Christian parents in a Christian home. So a lot of advantages there. But no reason to be ignorant about anything. But here he doesn't want them to be ignorant about the purpose of these gifts. About their use of edification during the infancy of the church. And how they were to cooperate and work together and have the right attitude toward one another. You know that you were Gentiles. And this is interesting. You were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols. However, you were led. Well, physically speaking, they were still what? They were still Gentiles, but he seems to be using this word Gentiles in another way. He's saying you were Gentiles. What he's saying is before you were Christians. Okay? Before you were part of the Israel of God. Before you were part of spiritual Israel. Uh, you were led away by dumb. Now, he's not talking about stupid here in our English. That word dumb means what? Yeah, speechless, voiceless. Uh, you know, idols, uh, they can't, they can't cooperate, communicate, right? Um, and so, and, and this is not unusual for Paul. He does this. In Romans 6, he does it in Ephesians 2, he does it in Titus 3. He does this in a lot of places. But when he starts to address people and their issues, he first reminds them of what? Where they came from. What their spiritual condition was before. This is where you were before, spiritually speaking. And, and he's doing that to remind them of how much better off they are now. See? See? You came from here, now you're here. Yeah. He tells the Romans who, who there wasn't change, what, can we continue in sin that grace can abound? They had to make the change. Yeah. So he said, what are you doing? There's no change here. And he's reminding them, look, you know, this is where you were. You were carried about by idols that, that can't communicate. You, you know, you manufactured and bowed down to a God that can't help you. That's where you were, however you were led. In other words, whichever way you went. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Accursed means doomed to destruction. Um... Obviously, back then, 
People could be directly led by the Spirit of God, right? Well, someone comes in saying Jesus is accursed. I know he's not being led by the Spirit of God. God wouldn't say that. I like it was kind of interesting. A um, couple of commentators uh, and Greek scholars, Robertson and Plummer, say the blasphemous anathema however they said Jesus, would be more likely to be uttered by a Jew than a Gentile. It is not improbable that Saul himself used it in his persecuting days and strove to make others do so also. Unbelievers, whether Jews or Gentiles, were admitted to Christian gatherings, and therefore one of these might suddenly exclaim in the middle of a public worship, right, to the inexperienced Corinthians, a mad shout of this kind might seem to be inspired. But Paul assures them that this anti-Christian utterance is absolutely derisive, derisive and it cannot come from the Spirit. That word anathema is one of 103 words which in the New Testament are found only in the writings of Paul and Luke. And so, you know, if somebody shouts that, you know that wasn't inspired. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Well, even today, if I acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, where did I get that from? Now, I didn't get it directly, but I got it from the Holy Spirit, didn't I? Because I got it from His Word. So even today... Uh, but, of course, during that time, we're talking about this direct leading. So, I can't receive a new revelation, but I can make sure it's scriptural, and if it agrees with it. You know, the question today for people that believe they're getting something new is, is why? What's the necessity? If it agrees with scripture, it would have to, right? If I got a direct revelation from the Holy Spirit, it would have to agree with what He's already said, right? So if it already agrees with what He said, why would I need it? And if it doesn't agree with it, then it's not from Him. To say Jesus is Lord, though, is to say that He's what? I'm saying that He's what? He's God, right? I'm saying He's, he's God. So, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. That word diversities can be translated by Thayer as distribution, distinction, difference, a distinction arising from a different distribution to different persons. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. Um, I think the King James says administrations, but that's that word diakonia. So different ministries. And there are diversities of activities. I think the King James says operations, but you could say diversities of activities or workings, I think the, the American Standard says. But it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit. Of all. Now we're getting to the, where the rubber meets the road. What are they for? So he says distributions. There was a distribution made by a single source. They all originate from the Holy Spirit. But he distributed different gifts to different people and not even everyone got one. They're spread out and the fact that you got it means you didn't get it by merit. You didn't earn it. It's a gift. But each particular gift had an end in mind. And the end in mind is verse 7. It's given to each one for what? He distributes these miraculous spiritual gifts among the various congregations before this was completed for the profit of all. Right? For the profit of all. But they come from the same source. And if they come from the same source, then it goes without saying that they weren't given to produce division. If they all came from the Spirit, they were given to produce what? 
unity. They're given to produce unity. Y'all have taken them and you've allowed them to produce division. But they came from the same God. It's interesting he mentions all three members of the Godhead here. There are diversities of gift, but what? The same what? Spirit. Diversities of ministries or distributions, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities or workings, but it's the same who? God, who works all in all. So, you've all got this particular gift, you've all got your work to perform, but you didn't earn it, it was given to you, and it was given from the same source. And it was given for the profit of all. All right. So next time, we'll talk about that list. There's nine of them. We'll see what all these people had.